Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to this edition of Children Need Arts. My name is Adam Holm and we are broadcasting from a very beautiful flat in the heart of Copenhagen. As you can probably see on my left shoulder, you've got the canal behind me, we've got the Opera House and we're right here in what is unusually sunny Copenhagen. And joining us from sunny Jamaica, I'm glad to welcome none other than Holly Bass. Very good to see you, Holly. So good to be here, Adam. And thank you for joining us. You're the National Director for Turnaround Arts in Washington, but you're currently in your artistic exile in sunny Jamaica. Um, I'd like to ask you, both as a director and as a performing artist, um, you know, a, a very broad question to begin with, Holly. What effect would you say that the arts have on children's ability to learn, speaking in broad terms? It's been my experience that as an artist and as an educator, when I am able to use the arts in the classroom, I find that children just open up. They, they open up emotionally, they open up crea creatively. There's a sense of play, there's a sense of possibility. And when you have that kind of dynamic in a classroom, uh, learning becomes very rich and very easy. But also, I mean, you're faced sometimes with, with classes, with schools, where the pupils come from massively different backgrounds. You know, there are a diverse range of social uh, and economic challenges. Uh, in what way can you use the teaching of arts and creative subjects uh, to sort of uh, bridge the gap, if you like? Well, I like to think of it not so much as bridging the gap, but um, embracing the culture that the children are coming from. And so particularly when we're talking in, let's say, the American context, and we're talking about black children, Latino children, um, Asian children who are coming from working class or poor economic environments, those cultures are already rich with music, with dance, with language, just as a matter of course. And so if I'm able to bring that into the classroom, the children are able to identify more and recognize themselves and feel more at ease in the classroom setting. Mm -hmm. And in that process, what would you say, given your own experience, again, as a performing artist, as an educator, uh, what would you say that, that teachers should be most aware of? Because there must be a few uh, traps here and there. Uh, you know, you, you might risk falling into a trap. So, so what, what is the mistake that teachers are most likely to make and that they should be aware of not making, of course? I think the biggest trap, and I see this over and over when I come as a visiting artist into the classroom, I think the biggest trap is um, coming into the classroom with uh, limited ideas of your student's potential. And it may be based on their past behavior. Maybe you have a student who has always earned poor grades, or maybe you have that student who's known for having behavioral issues, and so you just sort of write them off and say, oh, well, that kid is just a lost cause, or that kid is just too difficult to deal with. And a lot of times when I'm able to come in as an artist and work with students, teachers say, oh my gosh, I didn't know this, this student was capable of this level of creativity, of this level of communication. It's happened over and over and over. So it's something that I know to be true from experience and, and trial and error. So there's a risk of underestimating the capacity within each student. Um, how do you eradicate that, so to speak? I mean, how do you, how do you challenge that um, prejudice? Yeah, I think that um, all educators really owe it to themselves to be constantly questioning their own biases and beliefs and to be um, really aware of these very subtle and, and, and sort of nuanced cultural expectations that we may have grown up with, that we think are perfectly normal, that we think are the right way to do things. I think often the right way to do things um, is kind of a code for the dominant sort of, you know, whether it's the white supremacist or um, whether it's about um, class, elitist, those kinds of hierarchical structures often fall under this idea, well, this is the right way to do it, or this mm. is how we've always done it. And it's really time to embrace new ideas and new approaches and to really um, 
look inside ourselves and question ourselves and say, why aren't my students reaching their highest potential? It's not them, they're children. It must be something that the adults need to change. And do you find that there is a willingness to, to, to ask these questions of oneself, I mean, to, to address this issue uh, when you talk to educators? Are they, when you make them aware of, of this trap, are they, you know, open to new ideas and say, oh my gosh, yeah, I should, I should change that? You know, it, it really depends. I think for a lot of people, when we start questioning some of those beliefs and values, it, it, for some people, it feels like their whole identity and worldview becomes questioned, and it feels like very um, uncertain, like, a sh like you're suddenly on a shaky foundation. And so some people really resist making those changes. But I do find that the teachers that we work with primarily in our program, because they're already arts-oriented, they have an orientation toward creativity and toward uh, constant learning. And I do find that they often say, oh, wow, my eyes have been opened, and now I, I have this new understanding, and I, I see the work that I need to begin doing, and I'm happy to do that work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Holly, you touched upon this before. Uh, obviously, you're no stranger to the fact that part of America's social fabric is racism and xenophobia. Um, how can teaching the arts and you know the creative subjects in general, how can they help eliminate racism in, in your own country? Is that at all possible? I mean, I, I would hesitate to say that the arts can eliminate you know, racism and xenophobia, but what the arts can do is give us a window into other cultures and give us a window into the humanity of other people. Oftentimes, um, particularly with children, when they have this idea like, oh, this person is different from me, it's scary. We can use the arts and open up this new idea of like, oh, this is different, it's exciting. It's different, it's, it's new. It's different, it's delightful. And so you kind of shift away from fear into love, into embracing. And then you also um, invite those students to embrace their own culture and identity because oftentimes children feel shame if they're growing up in a poor area, for instance, or if they're growing up and they see like, well, the people on TV don't look like me, so is there something wrong with me? And so no, we want to say difference is beautiful. Let's embrace it. So it's fair to say, just to briefly sum up what you're saying, Holly, that art can be viewed as a common language, which, you know, in spite of your ethnicity or, or other cultural background, religious background, you can use art as a way of communicating. Absolutely, and I almost would shy away from even saying it's a common language. I think what it is is more like a portal that opens up the plurality of our languages and our cultures. And so we don't need one common language. We actually need to embrace all of the different languages, all of the different cultures, and embrace our own. And so we can do that through the arts. We can say, this is what I come from and what I believe in and how I was raised and what my family thinks is valuable. And this is what your family thinks is interesting and valuable and good. And I can relate to you Mm. through my own cultural lens. And I want to be the most broad, um, accepting human being that I can be, and I want to engage with the world. Just on a private note, I should like to add that I strongly adhere to everything you're saying. I, and I, I, you know, if I could vote for you, I would do so. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's brilliant, but um, I, I'm sure in your capacity as national director, uh, you must have had talks with politicians and when you talk to politicians, at least that's what it's like in Denmark, they will often bring up the matter of money, budgets. And, and we are, all of us here, uh, due to the COVID crisis, we are faced with, you know, um, uh, expenses are being cut these days, at least in Denmark. So my question is, when you talk to politicians and they say, okay, we listen to what you're saying, Holly, it's all good, but it's expensive and we need to cut down on expenses. How would you answer that? Well, uh, one thing I would say is it's expensive to not invest in our future. It will cost us further down the line. And as we move away from you know, just an industrialized society to um, 
the new creative economy where technology and innovation are the drivers of the economy, we need to stop you know, treating students like we're training them to be factory workers. That's not what we need to be training students to do now. They need to be our next generation of innovators and creative thinkers so that they can drive this economy and, and keep the society thriving. So that's one argument I would make. The other th argument I would make is, you know, um, people who have wealth and access, they never think of cutting the arts for their children. Their children get to go to the symphony, to the dance concert, to the art museum. It's only really the students that don't have the resources where we say, maybe you don't deserve that. And it's not really about the budget at the end of the day, I think. It's about the value that we assign to all of the people in our country. And are we really living up to our ideals about e equality among people? So that mm -hmm. people who don't have money are just as valuable and important to our society as people who have lots of money. I get that, but what if you were countered again by someone who would say, okay, it's all very well, Holly, but at the end of the day, uh, first of all, it's very costly in spite of what you're saying, uh, and secondly, these you know, uh, creative subjects, you might call them soft skills, you can acquire them elsewhere. You can go to the movies, you can go to some of the national galleries in Washington, for instance, uh, you, you, can, you can read a book, whereas being taught English, being taught mathematics. These are hardcore values that you need to place emphasis on in schools. The other things, you know, soft skills. I mean, I have a few arguments for that. I would say, you know, math, well, you could use the calculator that's on your phone to do most of your math. But we teach math not just so that people know how to add up numbers, but so that they know how to problem solve and think. And we can use the arts integrated with academic subjects. So that's one of the big um, elements, actually, of turnaround arts, is not just uh, access to arts experiences, but arts integration. So that I've seen a brilliant dance teacher do a, a lesson on fractions by having students move their bodies to a quarter circle, half circle. And so suddenly these abstract concepts that can be very difficult for children to grasp, they're physicalized, they're internalized, and it's like, oh, I understand now. Mm. So I actually think we can use the arts to enhance all of those hard <laughs> skills that we think are important. Wow, there was a dog barking uh, in your background. I hope it wasn't a politician. <laughs> <laughs> a critical politician. Holly, <laughs> um, uh, in your own organization, Turnaround Arts, um, what is your, if you were to explain it to our viewers, what, what is your sort of basic approach to this matter when it comes to bringing out the arts and creative ideas to students to um, young pupils? At Turner on Arts, we really believe that all children deserve access to the arts. And we know that um, not all school systems have equal resources in this country. And so one of the things that we try to do is provide um, some basic resources by making a, a sort of relationship and contract with the district and with the superintendents by saying, We'll provide musical instruments. We'll provide access to um, musical theater. If you commit to um, making sure that these schools have a, an arts teacher so that students can get the arts every single week, we'll provide grant funding. We'll provide professional development for your teachers. So we're really about building relationships with schools, with districts, and superintendents so that the arts can become a fabric part of the fabric of the school. And then hopefully, after several years of this kind of investment, the schools have the ability to maintain that arts enrichment and see the sort of academic and social benefits of doing so. And what, what impact does it have on the students? Are you able to, to monitor that? We haven't necessarily monitored it through evaluation, but certainly through conversations with students and doing interviews with them. Our program um, focuses on elementary and middle schools with the idea that you want to give children the arts early on and to cultivate that love and they'll want to continue. And we are seeing that. Our program has been in existence about nine years. So we have students who are now in high school or are recently graduating. And I um, actually saw an interview with some recent students. They said, um, 
they were in middle school, they did not like school, but they loved going to band practice. And they wanted to go to the high school that had the music program. And for that reason, they, they forced themselves to do better on their academic subjects so they could qualify for the music school. So it was really music that was driving them to stay in school and to do well. And then they were able, as they got older, to say, you know what? Being in the band has taught me so much about leadership, has taught me so much about responsibility, working collaboratively, being part of a team, has taught me about practice and working hard and overcoming challenges. And I am a better human being because I was in the band and because I had those experiences that I will carry with me my whole life. So those are the stories that we're hearing from our students about how dance, how writing, how music has helped them grow into young adults who really have so much potential to do great things in the world. And it sounds terrific uh, on an individual level, uh, but could you say or could you conclude that it's also, you know, that, that whole process of introducing art and creative subjects to people from perhaps uh, less well-off backgrounds, is that beneficial for society as such? Well, I, I think it's it's difficult to sort of, you know, take instances of, of a school here, a school there, and say, this is going to change the world. But one of the things when Turnaround Arts was formed, it was important to the founders that it not just be in one city or in one state. So it started with eight schools across the country in different environments, in rural environments, in um, inner city environments you know, urban environments, so that we could really test this idea of how the arts can be transformative. And we have found that it is um, effective. But of course, we are just one organization. Right now, we're currently with about 60 schools in about 10 different states. So it works, but it, it requires diligence and time. It's not, there's no easy fix, I would say that. No, and I'm, I'm sure you know what you're talking about. But would you say that there is political support for what you're doing? Are you finding it difficult to operate or are you getting uh, basically all the help you're asking for? It's always a challenge. Even the schools that are doing well, even the schools that are able to show positive benefits, I think every year there's kind of a process of lobbying and saying, look, we've got the results. Please help us keep this program alive. And that's just the nature, I think, of uh, the American education system and political system. I think the current administration is much more, um, going to be much more supportive of these kinds of programs. And we're fortunate to have a first lady who is also um, an educator. And that's something that's really valuable, I think. But it's never, it's never been easy and I don't anticipate it necessarily um, becoming easier, but it's important work. So we dedicate ourselves to doing it. Yeah, I know you're truly dedicated. Holly Bass, thank you very much. You and Turnaround Arts are doing your very best to make a difference. Uh, so thank you for being with us and enjoy your stay in Jamaica. I hope to see you in Copenhagen next year. Absolutely. I'm so excited to see you all in Copenhagen. Okay. Bye-bye, Holly. Bye.